Institutions on the Future of Europe. This event is organized by the European Policy Center in cooperation with Blocksec, an independent think tank based in Bratislava, which is committed to enhancing security, prosperity and sustainability in Europe and around the world. Since Wednesday last week, we can finally say Habemus a joint declaration. After a year-long delay and a great deal of interinstitutional haggling, the President of the European Commission, European Parliament and Council put their pen to a paper that sets the broad framework of this much anticipated initiative. According to the document, the conference, which is expected to officially kick off on May, uh, 9 May this year and wrap up by spring 2022, will open a new space for debate with citizens to address Europe's challenges and priorities so that people from all walks of life and corners of the Union, especially younger generations, can have their say on the future of Europe. The intention is to have a bottom-up uh, process consisting of events organized across the European Union. At the European level, the EU institutions commit to holding European citizens' panels. At the member states' level, the signatories leave the organization of national, regional, local or even transnational events to the willingness of different national level actors to hold national citizens panels on thema or thematic debates in line with their own national specificities. Who are these national stakeholders who could or should be in charge of setting up events with citizens? Are the member states preparing at present for this task? What kind of events should the member states organize to engage their citizens in the conference context? How should national debates be linked to one another and to the European level discussions? What are the risks, challenges and opportunities in establishing a national participatory dimension to this conference? These are the kind of questions we would like to address today, together with our distinguished speakers, including Martin Klus, State Secretary for European Affairs of the Slovak Republic, Mark Boimer, Under Secretary for European Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia, Sandro Gotti, Member of the European Parliament in the Renew Europe Group, Noel O'Connell, Chief Executive um, Officer at the European Movement Ireland, and George Pagulatos, Professor at the Athens University of Economics and Business and at the College of Europe and Director General of the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. Many thanks to all of you for taking the time to speak to us today. I will first have an exchange with the panelists and then everyone in the audience will have the chance and be encouraged to ask questions live or in written as you prefer. And I would like to start from the State Secretary. Uh, Mr. Klus, and kindly ask him, how does Slovakia see the conference and how is your country pre preparing to contribute to it? Uh, hello, greetings from uh, Bratislava. Here is uh, Gabriela talking on behalf of uh, Mr. Martin Klus. Uh, we would like to apologize because he just finished the press conference and he's on his way. So. If you uh, could just keep the, the row and give a floor to somebody else, we are very eager to talk in, in about five minutes. Apologies, but the political situation uh, didn't allow us to, uh, to organize no, it. No worries. We will move in then to uh, Undersecretary Volmer and ask him essentially the same question about Estonia. What about Estonia's preparations for the uh, organization of citizens' events in the context of the conference? Well, the expectations uh, have been there for a long time. And, and of course, uh, now when we, as you mentioned, we have the joint declaration and we have executive board, uh, things seem to be moving. So uh, let's say the expectations are now even more, uh, more concrete. And, and of course, uh, excellent work by Portuguese presidency, uh, what that actually uh, finally took us to there where we are today. So, um, um, the kickoff events uh, will probably be almost everywhere around the 9th of May. Here in Estonia, we are planning our first event on 10th of May, which is Monday, because 9th is actually weekend. So, so maybe it's more efficient when we uh, kick off uh, 10th of May. Uh, 
uh, there will be um, a different set of things and sort of the, the main players who are planning those things in Estonia when we, are, as you mentioned we have the joint uh, declaration uh, our um, um, sort of uh, European secretariat that is based on the prime minister's office they are covering the whole uh, field of EU uh, and they do it together with the foreign ministry uh, who have sort of uh, some areas of, of the EU agenda and of course we all will rely a little bit on, on the commission representation which is in every capital and, and sort of their um, job description probably involves uh, uh, pop, you know, uh, making EU issues known and popularizing so, so we can do a lot of cooperation with them. So there's sort of three main stakeholders in Estonia. And so there will be special events, conferences, uh, we go to the schools, we try to go where the people are. That will be a challenge, of course. Uh, we know from the previous events like that, that you can actually go to a region and invite people to discuss and then you have three people coming or you know five or ten so so this is actually the main um, uh, one of the main challenges in this road so to make the information move around and make it uh, interesting and challenging enough so that people actually turn out and then want to speak um, so we go to the schools which is easier because the students can't run away so they have to be there and discuss um, so there will be different many many different events but um, but of course we are waiting um, a lot information now from this um, executive board because um, uh, we don't know the framework it's good they are there but but uh, in order to make this uh, um, somehow working uh, we need some kind of clear framework that enables us to reach conclusions so what sort of um, they probably we can suggest them uh, of our interest like a green health digital economic recovery uh, global leader, all the roles, but but it has to be somehow be uh, clustered uh, from from the secretariat, and then somehow to to tell us how will those citizens' view actually end up somewhere? How do we do it in a real process? So there's a lot of th um, details that we need uh, from this uh, uh, secretariat now to um, to to come up and then help us to prepare all those events that we are planning here in Estonia. So if I understand correctly, the events that you're planning, and we're talking about events in plural, uh, I suppose you don't know the number at this stage, uh, they will be in different formats, correct? Um, and it will be um, up to the uh, European Secretariat that you've mentioned to, to decide uh, on the exact agenda. Um, is this correct? Uh, yes, th th there's, there will be many, many, many events. I mean, uh, probably not tens, but hundreds, uh, so that we can actually include all the, the citizens uh, in Estonia, because that's, I think that's the idea, to have this bottom-up approach that the, the, the voice of the people will be here. And then if we do that, of course, it's important that this voice actually is here and it, it, it reaches somewhere, because otherwise there will be disappointment and we are even worse off than before that the future conference starts so so to avoid any disappointments so it has to be the well prepared clear path and then somehow the, the feedback has to reach the people again that, that how it was done what what was their voice uh, how did it uh, compare to other other countries um, voices so so yeah and and the uh, and the, the events we're planning together it's actually sort of consortium of uh, of foreign ministry prime minister's office and, and then the commission's office so we, it's, it's a joint effort that we are doing mm -hmm. and do you do you already know if these events will will seek to collect input from citizens on specific questions or whether they will be more of an information campaign about um, the state of European, different European policies or, or plans uh, um, linked to the EU level? Well, we, we try to do both, actually. Of course, we uh, we want to use this opportunity uh, to tell about Europe, uh, what is happening, what are the things, uh, and to let people to ask the questions so that we could um, dispel some some prejudices or, or things. So, so we definitely want to use this as a sort of information and then promotion event. But, of course, we need to also sort of uh, have the the feed for the conference uh, conclusions or that end up so so we also and, and for that we need this uh, ex executive board to come up with a framework so which questions uh, so it's i'm sure there will be a green there will be digital uh, democracy and and then some subtopics so that we can okay for this question estonian answer uh, 
is like sixty uh, percent of people want that, uh, you know, twenty percent want that. So they, that somehow that how we can uh, upload this um, information uh, to this sort of uh, path that that leads to the conclusions that that beautiful day next ring. Uh, and because you mentioned the digital, um, are there any learnings from the Estonian uh, perspective about the importance of using digital tools? to engage people in political affairs. Yeah, I guess that's kind of expectation from uh, from Estonia because in, in, in our government system, 99% of all the services are digital. So uh, if, if we um, are sort of coming up with this kind of um, uh, uh, new consultation, people do expect it to have um, sort of, of some digital outcomes. And we are already using many platforms where people can participate in, in the life of society and the government. Uh, there are e-consultation platforms where actually people see the, the legislative uh, proposals in the government and they can say what they think about it or, or it, so it's sort of direct, direct link to the government decision making. Uh, then in the open government partnership, uh, there's also one portal uh, that allows people to to feed and the, the, so there's actually many also sort of citizen in initiatives uh, uh, where people can uh, bring up new issues and, and bring it to the parliament's attention so we, we're already using many many digital tools uh, to involve people in in, in decision making and and we do plan to have this kind of um, uh, tools and maybe maybe we can use some of those already existing tools uh, uh, for for uh, uh, this uh, future conference and, and <clears throat> at, at least to um, to put the results up because uh, digital is good but it doesn't uh, uh, actually uh, change the real life so we need to have the real meeting the physical meeting of people to to get out there to see them to have discussions and that of course then depends on the virus and how that will happen so no, nothing will happen probably in, in april uh, hardly in may but but maybe from june july and on 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 a fall we can already have physical consultation have people together and then have the outcome in digital form so that people could be visible and then people can still add and participate in the digital platforms. Finally, have you had any kind of exchanges with other member states um, about this, this event in, in a attempt to, to coordinate efforts at all? Well, it, it's in our plans, in, in this our joint plan that we have. Um, there is uh, uh, ideas to um, do something together with our neighbors, which uh, are Finland and, and Latvia, and then maybe also Sweden. But we, we haven't um, got to very practical yet. So we uh, we hope that they will be also be interested and that we can do some joint uh, issues. But of course, uh, the problem with the joint events uh, is that they have to be in English. And if it's in English, so, so it, it sort of a little bit narrows the, the, the number of participants who are brave enough to come and then debate in, in English because the, the, the languages are different. Maybe with Finns, it's very close. I mean, we could almost the same language. So could, maybe we can overcome the language issue there. But, um, but uh, the, to do the, the, the brainstorming and event jointly is it's very good. It sort of uh, makes the horizon bigger and, and much more interesting. But from the other hand, the language issue could make it a bit more um, uh, exclusive. Thank you very much, Mr. Vona. Um, Mr. Klutz, Secretary of State Klutz, uh, thank you very much for, um, for joining us. Welcome. Um, I had actually started with you, so I'm coming back to you with, uh, with the same question. I didn't know you were not with us online earlier. Um, a similar question to the one for Estonia. How does Slovakia see this conference and how is your country pre preparing for the organization of this national event with citizens um, in Slovakia? Good afternoon to everybody and I'm really sorry for my short delay. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion uh, across uh, the political uh, sphere today. One of them uh, include also the, the discussion about the conference of the future of Europe. And I'm very proud that uh, all, of the, all of those uh, ministries, uh, including uh, presidential office, prime minister office, and national council office are uh, very eager to take part on the conference. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, all of the uh, preparation has been already 
uh, discussed at the governmental level and uh, approved by government. So now we are more or less ready. Uh, we are also starting uh, a very interesting and fruitful cooperation with our media. So we are in the preparation process of the beginning. I hope 9th of May will bring the uh, beginning of the conference uh, where all three um, main uh, political bodies in Slovakia will be present. So president, uh, national council speaker, and also uh, prime minister. And then we will start with uh, two uh, lines of the conference. Uh, first will be uh, so-called We Are EU. Uh, that will be dedicated uh, to the citizens. Uh, and uh, we will try our best to... to uh, uh drive through slovakia and and introduce how important uh, europe uh, is uh, for uh, our citizens and especially listen to them how do they expect the future uh, of the europe uh, should looks like uh so that will be first uh, important project we will start depend on the pandemic but hopefully in the half of may and then the rest of the summer and uh, we will continue up to the end of uh, uh, of the autumn time. Uh, then we have uh, another special project, second line of the project of the Conference of the Future of the Europe. And that one is dedicated uh, to experts. And uh, we call uh, this, uh, this part uh, National Convention. Uh, it will be uh, divided uh, to the 16 working groups. Uh, and uh, all of our ministries uh, uh, scholars uh, as well as the third sector representatives uh, will be present uh, to the different topics there of course uh, politicians as well and and uh, uh, we will try to find the answers on the professional level uh, to very different topics for instance environment uh, uh, tra transport and whatever uh, so i'm really much uh, looking forward to what will be the outcome of uh, these uh, 16 working groups because we will uh, get uh, a written outcome of uh, the leaders of these working groups and, and uh, they will serve uh, especially to the uh, Slovak politicians as uh, as important uh, inputs to 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 creating European policies uh, and of course national policies as well as uh, well last but not least uh, we will be very uh, pleased if if uh, there will be uh, huge support of our uh, cities and self-governing regions so we really want to include also this part of uh, of uh, governing of Slovakia. And uh, so far, we get very positive reply from all of them. And uh, uh, it's uh, even more important because uh, uh, this will bring a kind of sustainability for us, uh, that all of these uh, bodies will uh, continue in this discussion. It will be uh, officially over uh, during the French presidency. How, how important do you think that it is for all member states to commit to the uh, organization of citizens' uh, events in their national arena? And, and how do you think that those countries uh, which might lack the resources or, or experience to do so can be helped to participate as well? I guess it's very, very important. And uh, I can feel that also at the General Affairs Council when I'm representing Slovakia, I can feel that also at the uh, summits of the leader that there are some issues uh, how we expect the future of the European Union should look like. And uh, that's why it is very, very important to, to uh, discuss it with our citizens, because I believe it's important for anybody in this country to know that uh, uh, French or Spanish or uh, Swedish approach is different than the one we are having in our country. And we need to discuss with our citizen why is it so? And uh, that's what I said also to our Austrian friends, which already who already started uh, with a kind of a conference uh, on the future of Europe uh, during the summertime. Uh, my colleague Karoli, who is a minister for Europe, is very active in this uh, in this uh, case, and and uh, uh, their aim is even to open uh, uh, discussion about uh, how to change. Uh, uh, legislation, primary legislation of the European Union, aki communautaire, and uh, we are not against. Uh, let's speak about this possibility. But for us, it's very important also to have a chance to close them down, and uh, to make sure that we are having uh, answers and we are able to find a compromise. 
So from this point of view, it is very, very important for us to listen to our citizens and they could lead us to this compromise and to make sure that uh, there is a will uh, to maybe change something, to reform something in the European Union, because we know that uh, last change uh, took place in 2009. And so far we are having 12 years uh, later and uh, world is somewhere else. So that's why conference is very important for us. Um, as far as I understand, you have a um, rather complex process um, uh, planned for, uh, for these events to, to, to unfold. And I'm wondering whether you have uh, some clear objective or objectives in mind by which to judge the success of, uh, uh, of these events uh, at, at, at the end of the process. Frankly speaking, for me, it will be a huge disappointment if it will be just a discussion. We need to have some result. Uh, I expect national result from these uh, 16 working groups, as I already mentioned. I need a kind of a result uh, from the project uh, We Are EU because uh, we need to make sure that uh, citizens could declare whatever they want uh, about uh, their European future. It's their Europe, so that's why. And uh, I believe we can also discuss uh, uh, these issues uh, at the highest level of uh, uh, European Union, uh, including European institutions. So uh, if uh, there is any will to change something, uh, let's uh, open this topic. And uh, I believe uh, there will be will of also contemporary commission and the president of the council to, to have some results. And uh, I'm more or less sure that uh, it will be a hot topic also during the uh, German uh, uh, parliamentary election this autumn, and it will be also a hot topic uh, during the French presidential election next uh, spring. So both of these uh, uh, events, uh, which are very important for Europe, uh, will uh, bring some uh, fresh uh, energy to, to, to the project. And, and I believe it, that will be also important for Slovakia. Thank you very much, Mr. Klus. Mr. Gotti, how does the European Parliament intend to contribute to the development of, of the national dimension of, uh, of this conference and, and help uh, um, the efforts of, of the different member states? Well, I mean, for us, it was uh, the, this conference was uh, absolutely a priority as European Parliament. And for me and for us, uh, the, the Renaissance delegation it was even more important because uh, uh, the first uh, our list was inspired by the letter of Emmanuel Macron uh, of the 4th of March 2019, which ended that letter to the European citizen with the proposal of the conference. Uh, so, I mean, we wished that the conference had already started. It hasn't started because of COVID and because of uh, lengthy negotiation between European Parliament and Council, but now we got it and we have to make the most of it. And uh, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to speak from the uh, European Parliament perspective and then from the national perspective. That is what you are you're asking me. Yes, I'm asking first about the EP, but I will certainly uh, come uh, come also to uh, to France and Italy and, and ask you some uh, questions about uh, those countries. From the Parliament perspective, we had already adopted uh, several documents, several resolutions uh, saying uh, very clear things. It must be, of course, uh, uh, citizen focused. Uh, it must be physical and digital. We are working together with the Rovia Commission uh, for an interact interactive multilingual digital platform because uh, we think that both uh, approaches are necessary. Of course, as, as soon as the COVID the, the Arctic situation allows it, we have to have a physical meeting, but all along uh, the process, <coughs> the uh, multilingual digital platform must ensure that there will, there will be the, the full participation, a, a, the widest participation of citizens as possible. And uh, I mean, of course, we have also drawn the positive lesson of the crisis. Each of us today, we are online. Each of us has learned to work online. I think that this should be also an additional tool uh, to make uh, the success of this initiative. Uh, the, the, the citizen representation must, be, uh, must reflect the European diversity. <clears throat> must be very balanced, must mirror the geogra geographic diversity, the gender diversity, the age diversity. This is another ingredient for our success. And we, we want for the discussion at European level, <clears throat> organize European citizens panels or 
a European thematic agora, as we called. Ideally, that should compose each panel, each agora should be composed of 200, 300 citizens. Uh, they should be, uh, in our view, selected randomly by independent national authorities. So we should have at least three citizens per country, minimum, but this is the very minimum, and they should be divided freely, uh, autonomously. Uh, and uh, this would ensure uh, a, a very strong contribution to this bottom-up approach, which is very nice, which we always use it in politics, uh, national politics, European politics, but that, I mean, very often it is difficult to turn into reality. Uh, so, I mean, this would be uh, certainly something, uh, something that uh, we do believe uh, it, would, uh, it would help. Then uh, how do we, uh, do we uh, measure the success or the seriousness? But in my view, uh, the success is uh, depend on the outcome and, and depend on the follow-up. Of course, we hope, uh, and it doesn't depend only on us, it depends on all the member states that, I mean, uh, Today, they are showing that two member states are showing their strong commitment. I'm very pleased uh, with what I, I've heard so far. Uh, but I mean, after all, this will be uh, the first, uh, the first uh, race uh, to ensure the widest participation and mobilization as possible. Uh, then we hope that in May next year, possibly 9th of May next year, we will have a political declaration. Uh, and then we have to ensure the follow up. And to me, uh, the follow-up is serious and credible if it is uh, without taboos and if it is open. So if we are really committed to ensure a follow-up to the request, we don't know what the main priorities will be. We don't know what the strongest request will be. We can have an idea, but, I mean, but we haven't even started the process. And then we will have to be ready uh, to do what it is necessary to ensure this follow-up. If there are some common policies to change, to be changed, we will have to change some common policies. If we have to change uh, the function of the institutions or the treaty, we have to be ready to change the function of the institutions or to change the treaty. Because this exercise, it, it makes sense if we are ready to ensure the follow-up. Otherwise, it's become a, a very nice uh, debate at the European level. It's always good to mobilize about European issues. It's always good. Uh, to ask citizens what do they want, what do they expect, and what they don't want uh, from the European Union. But it would be, um, it would be a really a huge missed opportunity if we, as European Parliament and uh, as a Council, as Commission, as a national parliament, we wouldn't be ready to ensure the proper and full follow-up to the main request of the citizens. Absolutely. But do you think it will be difficult to make sense of the results if uh, every member state uh, does its own process and its own type of events and follows a different agenda? Well, I mean, I would, uh, first of all, uh, I would say that, I mean, it's good that each member state uh, is free uh, to decide uh, which kind of initiative to organize at which level. There will be member states that will, will want to work uh, uh, only with national institutions. There will be other member states that will want to work at regional level, at local level, at city hall level. And I think that this is perfectly fine because I think that each government, each member state should decide that the best, the most effective way to mobilize, uh, uh, to mobilize the citizens. Uh, it is clear that the executive board, uh, which has to start to work, has also to identify some, some uh, the specific details of the function of the exercise, and also probably suggest some areas around which uh, organize the specific panels, the, organize uh, uh, the specific questions, stimulate the debate, but the debate must remain open uh, to a suggestion, suggestion from citizens, suggestion from civil societies. Uh, uh, but it is clear that, I mean, some parameters uh, to make the exercise readable, as you say, uh, to be... Mm -hmm. uh, 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 inter uh, uh, to ensure the interoperability <laughs> yeah. of the different debate, we have to have uh, we have to agree on some parameters, uh, and yes. that's not the work of the executive board. And you're confident that these uh, parameters will be uh, uh, agreed upon? They must, because they we must. have the capital is waiting so long to have right. 
not the executive board. <laughs> now they better to do the job as they should. So this is exactly why they are there. And I think that the pressure is too high, the expectation is too high. And I think that uh, I, I'm confident that they will come up uh, with uh, useful parameters. That should be, uh, should always leave uh, clear margin for maneuvering for each, each uh, institute, uh, each level, I would say, not even each member state, each, each governance and democratic level in mm -hmm. the uh, member state uh, uh, to organize uh, as they wish. Uh, yeah. But it is clear that, I mean, the more, the more uh, efficient are the parameters, the, the, the higher the convergence will be. And also, uh, it, is, it will be easier, as we say, to withdraw some mm. concrete uh, conclusions of this debate. Mm. And, and, and what about this mobilization that you've mentioned? I mean, um, recently we've had the European Citizens Consultations uh, um, process that, that, that took place uh, across Europe. And uh, one of the criticisms that um, uh, has been leveled against it was that at the end of the day, it uh, failed to engage the um, uh, unusual suspects. How do we make sure that uh, we can reach out to all corners uh, of the EU and, and bring into this discussion ordinary citizens and citizens from all uh, walks of life? How, how do you think we can, we can uh, change things in this regard this time around? The citizens' dialogue was a first attempt. Um, I mean, I would say that, I mean, there are some positive lessons, but in general, we are a nice event for the commissioners of President Juncker when they organize mission in the different member state, instead of meeting the usual suspect like us, when I was in government, they meet a university, a school student. And it is true that it was a full step ahead, but it's not exactly what we expect. How? I mean, this is why we have, in my view, to let, to let um, uh, a, the possibility of to each institution at, at, uh, at member state level to organize itself. Because I mean, uh, they know much better than us uh, how to reach out to the unusual suspect. And mm -hmm. that, for example, national parliament, regional parliaments, um, cities. Uh, I mean, if they, we manage to really commit them, to involve them, mm -hmm. and support the national institutions, with a stronger effort in communication and explanation, because it is clear that this effort, I mean, we have, first of all, to make citizens, at least a majority of the citizens, I don't see all, but at least a majority of the citizens should be informed that this, uh, this exercise exists and should be aware of what they can do if they wish to participate in this exercise. I mean, so this is the first thing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to all our effort in terms of communication, in terms of information, uh, working with the office of the parliament at national level, working with the office of the European Commission, uh, working with the European offices of the member state, of the big region, of the land, uh, etc., to let people know. It is clear that we have also to insist a lot uh, with the mainstream media, mm. use uh, the usual European communication channels. We have go on the uh, uh, eight, eight hours, uh, 8 p.m. news, uh, and uh, to try to go there, the mainstream news, and, to let, and there to have uh, the possibility to tell citizens mm. this process is happening, you can participate, we are discussing this. So, I mean, we have really to work a lot, uh, of course, we cannot impose to the media, to yeah. say, but we have to work a lot, especially with mainstream media. Uh, yeah media, uh, digital, etc., to uh, spread the information about this exercise. Yes, very, very briefly. Um, during the European Citizens Consultations exercise, which included more than citizens dialogues, um, France was the champion uh, because it has organized the most consultations and it has really put up um, uh, a, a genuine effort to, uh, um, in this regard. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have Italy, um, who together with the UK essentially didn't participate. Uh, there was no event whatsoever uh, that took place um, uh, on the Italian side. So now for the conference, um, uh, what, if anything, is France and Italy preparing since you um, 
have links with both? Uh, well, I mean, France is very keen, and not only because it was Macron's idea and because it was our priority in the European election as Renaissance, uh, but because in France we have a very uh, positive experience, although difficult, of this kind of consultation. Uh, to, answer, to, to respond to the crisis of the Yellow Vest, the Gilets Jaunes, uh, Macron himself, but not only Macron himself, uh, I mean, uh, uh, collected almost uh, 2,000 uh, Two million of contribution online from citizens. Uh, we organized more than 10,000 physical meetings. Uh, we had uh, more than 16,000 of contribution from municipalities and local government on the um, on the uh, on the items organized. And this was a huge mobilization, not only of the president, but I mean of uh, all the level, all the political level, uh, from the LSA. Uh, to the municipalities, it, it had been uh, it, it had been uh, preceded by that good experience of the Grand March for Europe and the, of the citizens' dialogue, where France was certainly the best example. And also, there is uh, another experience, uh, more limited but uh, very significant, of the convention on the climate, the climate convention. Um, so, I mean, certainly France uh, will uh, play a key role. On the 25th of March, uh, uh, there will be the first meeting uh, in view of the French presidency that we also will discuss uh, this issue. The idea is to organize many conferences, many initiatives at regional level to uh, mobilize a lot of regions. And so to, to try to be uh, focused in this dimension. But as I say, we will know more uh, after the 25th of March, uh, what are the intentions of the conference. Uh, from the Italian perspective, I mean, you, you, um, the, the case you mentioned was the case of the uh, Conte government, where there were uh, two uh, populist uh, nationalist movement in, in power, which was the, the Five Stars and the Lega. And it was my successor, Paolo Savona, as minister, that decided not to do anything uh, with citizens' dialogue. Now, Italy has changed, thanks God. Uh, and uh, a pro European like Mario Draghi, I'm sure that will want uh, uh, also to mobilize Italy around this. I know that uh, they have already, uh, already foreseen a specific budget, international budget, to organize, I mean, uh, to organize this kind of events. So, I mean, I don't have information, but I'm sure that this is another side, positive side effect of the uh, replacement of Giuseppe Conte by Mario Draghi. Thank you very much, Mr. Gotti. Uh, Miss, Mrs. O'Connell, um, Ireland has an unrivaled reputation in organizing uh, citizens' consultations. So, um, I can imagine that uh, for you, this, uh, this citizens' events proposed now by the conference uh, are not nothing particularly new. Um, if you were to share from your country's experience in this regard, what kind of lessons would you advise the other member states to keep in mind when planning events in the context of the conference? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Karina. I think the learnings and the lessons that we would share with our European colleagues is that these citizen dialogues from an Irish perspective um, and again, agreeing with previous speakers, they have to be inclusive. They have to have a clear roadmap. They have to be transparent. Um, they have to have the buy-in of the public. Um, they have to be citizen-led, bottom-up, from the grassroots, and that the outcome doesn't disappear and peter off into the ether, that there has to be a tangible takeaway and a result. Um, from an Irish perspective, we are quite used to citizens' consultations and citizen-led engagement. Um, it is something that we have done quite successfully in recent years, looking at uh, very big ticket items that affect our constitution. So what do I mean by that? Since uh, we had a constitutional convention and we've then had a citizens' assembly that has been in use since 2016, that have resulted and led to significant societal outcomes here in Ireland. Each of those uh, citizen assembly consultations were mandated by the government of the day to consider specific issues that related to proposed amendments to the institution of Ireland, such as marriage equality and access to abortion. And those processes of deliberative democracy were centered on a representative number of citizens um, engaging 
with subject matter experts in these very specific policy areas. Transparency, of course, was key. It underpinned the process. Uh, documentation was made available and live streaming of the deliberations were also made available to the public with the media reporting um, on the outcomes um, on a regular basis. And then the outcomes, in fact, of those consultations led to two referendums taking place in Ireland. The first in 2015 resulted in the marriage equality referendum and the 2018 referendum approved access to abortion, leading changes to the, to the Irish constitution. And such has been the success of those citizens' assemblies that it actually continues its work today in a different format, focusing on gender equality and the provisions of that in the Irish constitution. And that is chaired by the former European Commission Secretary General, Dr. Catherine Day. So what we have seen in Ireland is when these are representative, when they are, are transparent, have an input from policy experts, citizen focused dialogues can result in a grounded bottom up approach to engaging with very complex political and societal issues. On a European perspective, at a European level, obviously following the rejection of the Nice Treaty in 2001, the then Irish government established a national forum on Europe, which really uh, opened up the debate and the information and provided a platform about European issues in Ireland. Following the Brexit referendum, we then, the Irish government created an all island Brexit forum, which got together civil society, cross-party political representatives, um, trade associations, academics, to debate and tease out the Brexit issues affecting the Ireland of Ireland. And that took place in parallel to a, a rolled out series of national dialogues of town hall debates mandated by the government, led by our Department of Foreign Affairs and our European Affairs Minister, on the future of Europe, on Ireland's relationship with Europe in a post-Brexit world. So we have had a long track record in Ireland mm -hmm. um, on these issues. And, and I think we've, we've managed to harness the learnings and takeaways that we, that we are really looking forward to embracing the rollout this time round. And, and drawing on this very rich uh, experience, what do you plan to do now in the context of this conference? Uh, well, like like many of the other speakers have have already uh, mentioned and referenced, uh, our rollout plan now in the world um, post COVID, I suppose the world BC before COVID, we would have had continued to embrace the physical town hall debates where we went to every part of of, of the country and engage with citizens on the ground. Now, I think we we will have to. Um, take some of the positives of, of, of the pandemic, so to speak, and look at a hybrid model, embracing a digital online version. Um, from an Irish perspective, we traditionally have quite high rates of support for the EU. Last year, it stood at 84% in our membership poll. But those attitudes can be fluent, um, as we have seen by the initial Irish rejection of the Nice and Lisbon treaties. But ensuring, I think, that both Irish and, and across the different member states, that people feel like active participants in the European project, in that European process, and that citizens have a role in shaping the EU that we all live in, that will garner increased support. Um, so I think what we are hoping to do is further expand on our previous grassroots driven uh, map of, of how we want to shape our journey with the EU. Um, we are now going to um, go, as I said, to that digital online uh, version. Um, and, and it has demonstrated to us how um, EU level issues, they filter down to, to people on both a local, a regional and a national level. And by by trying to reverse a finding that we found in our poll where only 33% of people in Ireland felt that their voice was heard as a citizen of the EU. And, and this, this is frankly not good enough, it must improve. So we want to continue to open up that process, ensure a greater level of transparency, and that will underpin the credibility giving to this pro, uh, project. And we'll continue to blend the World Cafe, the roundtable format, 
um, ensuring gender, age, demographic mixture and trying to get topics that matter and that are relatable uh, to people and that then we report back into our own government and that is used as it was previously on the road to CBU process but that report forms the bedrock and the underpinning of the Irish government's uh, input into this process as well. Do you think that the digital uh, aspect, um, which now we're constrained to, uh, to embrace given the pandemic, will be an obstacle uh, in reaching um, far and also in ensuring that these events are representative? I hope not. I really hope not. I, I hope that, um, I, th I think what we have seen is an increased um, in digital engagement, digital literacy, and those demographics that would be more challenged traditionally by all matters digital. I, I think of my own parents, they're now becoming very familiar to engaging online, whereas that mightn't have been the case before. What we did very successfully was target um, sports clubs, uh, women's organizations, farming associations, trade unions, chambers of commerce, to try and be as comprehensive and as extensive as possible in reaching out through both uh, traditional media, local, radio, digital, uh, online. So use every available platform and methodology we could to, to ensure that everyone was aware of them and that everyone had a, an opportunity to self-select and engage. And I think one of the things we have seen with our own events with digital is that instead of getting 100 people in a room, you are now opening up that process to over 300 upwards um, people having the opportunity to engage and follow the process online. And that can only be to the good. Thank you so much. George Pagodatas, can this work? Um, what is your take um, on, on, on this conference and especially its intention to engage directly with, uh, with citizens? Well, it's very important that we have it. Uh, last time this happened at the pan-European level was during the European Convention back in 2002. Um, it's very important to have it, even if it is imperfect. And clearly it is imperfect in the sense that the agenda is quite vague. The joint declaration does not really specify uh, what will be on the agenda, does not prioritize. There is um, uh, a lack of clarity on what exactly will be done with the feedback that will be generated um, at the grassroots level and how it will actually be able to lead to a, a real proposals and an action plan. It will be important and uh, the European Policy Center and you, Corina, together with Jan Semanoulis have, have drafted very valuable proposals on how to move this experience forward. But it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity because it's the first time uh, for after many years that European citizens will be able to be engaged. Um, I come from a country where the question, do you uh, feel that your voice is being heard in the European Union uh, has a very low uh, percentage of positive responses uh, among the lowest in the European Union. There's a clear sense that especially the economies in the periphery and those that have gone through crisis and Greece has been at the epicenter of two crises over the last decade, the debt crisis and the migration crisis hit uh, Greece particularly heavily. And today uh, it has taken a, a quite severe blow from the COVID-19 crisis, even though it has shown enormous resilience. So there is a sense that we need to be able to get our voice heard. You can feel that in society at the same time, while also registering one of the most pro-European and pro-EU and pro-Euro um, uh, public sentiments in the European Union and one of the most pro-European parliaments, I would say, in the European Union. Now, this is an important year uh, for Greece, uh, not just substantially, but symbolically. It's the 40th anniversary of uh, uh, Greece's membership in the European Union. Greece is the ninth oldest member of the European Union. Um, and this will offer an opportunity to merge um, the appreciation and the stock taking of these, uh, these 40 years of participation in the European Union with uh, a discussion of how to move forward uh, and how to participate and to contribute to this pan-European debate about a common future for the European Union. Thank you so much. Um, 
of course, uh, we know that um, if I'm not mistaken, Greece is also celebrating some 200 years of independence, but yes, yes, exactly. Um, so uh, a year full of, uh, of celebrations. Um, and, and how is Greece most putting more specifically preparing for, uh, for these uh, consultations or this event? Well, uh, there are preparations uh, by the government. Uh, as I said, the, the point when all these will culminate is around May, um, which is the real celebration of uh, Greece's accession to the European Union. Uh, next week is the celebration that you mentioned of 200 years of, uh, from the Greek Revolution of Independence and an extremely important landmark in, in the country's history and also an opportunity to look back and also to look forward. Um, there is a plan to organize by the government to organize citizens conventions, uh, citizens panels in cooperation with uh, the offices of the European Parliament and the European Commission uh, in Greece, involve civil society organizations, social partners, uh, chambers of commerce, trade unions, uh, organizations, universities, schools, regional and local authorities. Um, there is a national committee of experts that uh, will elaborate these findings and try to formulate them into proposals so as to um, uh, feed into a pan-European debate of what needs to be done. Um, the general sentiment is that we want this to actually deliver uh, some real change on the ground in terms of policy reforms, in terms of institutional reforms, if needed, treaty reforms, if needed. And it's important because there's always a, there's a sense of appreciation of the importance of the national debates uh, in the European Union, the debates that involve the European Union, because that's at, at the national level is where societal pressures and demands arise. And that's also where European solutions often die, suffocated under the pressure of domestic politics or national vetoes. So it's, it's very important to take into account national societies and to give a voice, especially to those that are not among the usual suspects that you mentioned before, those who fall below the radar of yes. uh, questionnaires to citizens and participating, uh, participation fora and so forth, uh, because they are the ones who feel that they are being left behind. It is important to address these uh, discussions, especially to the young people who mm -hmm. feel that this year hasn't worked very well for them, mm -hmm. either the previous one. There is a clear generational dimension in mm -hmm. the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, young people who have been deprived of the opportunity of uh, socialization and community and um, the camaraderie that is built in universities and schools substituted now through a digital, uh, virtual and very suboptimal experience. And of course, uh, even more importantly, perhaps, uh, that their own skill set and human capital uh, is, uh, is declining under these circumstances because they find it even more difficult to access yeah. the labor market especially in economies where joblessness rates have already been high, uh, mm -hmm. like those in uh, the south of the European Union. So it is important to involve younger people. It's important to involve those who feel that they've been left behind, uh, long-term unemployed, uh, people who uh, feel that the system doesn't work for them. And that said, of course, it's also important to address the risk of a, of a new kind of expectations capabilities gap, because mm -hmm. in as much as it is, is, is vital um, to uh, address the real challenges of people, joblessness, the sense of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, the need for better protection, the need to uh, participate in the European Union that is stronger in the world. Uh, uh, again, uh, the economy poses many challenges, including um, the, the need perhaps to strengthen uh, the mm -hmm. stimulus measures uh, in the face of new economic challenges and a prolonged um, uh, pandemic much longer than expected initially. Um, it, is, it is important to uh, address these challenges, uh, but provide uh, an action plan that can actually lead to improvements on the ground, rather mm -hmm. than raise expectations that will, uh, in subsequent stages, be disappointed uh, for the lack of any follow-up. So mm -hmm. what Sandro Gozzi said before, that uh, we need this to culminate into specific initiatives at the policy level. That's where European policymakers and institutions will take over. Uh, and that's what they need to take over is concrete action plans that will have arisen from the grassroots level 
uh, elaborated not just at the national, but also at the transnational level and being delivered to the European institutions to, make, uh, to, to take this forward. So important challenges ahead and uh, most of all, the challenge not to disappoint, mm. especially under this widespread exercise of civic participation across the European Union. Absolutely. So if I understand correctly, this will be an, a government-led exercise. Yes, it will be a government-led, government perhaps coordinated exercise, but mm -hmm. in parallel, <clears throat> there are also initiatives from civil society. Elia Mep, for that matter, yeah. my institution is part of one of these initiatives, in fact, coordinated by the European Policy Center involving uh, other think tanks in a total of eight countries. Uh, we will participate in uh, national citizen and local citizens agoras and uh, elaborate all that bring it into a transnational European dialogue and try to formulate the kind of pan-European responses to European challenges, having started from the national and from the regional and local grassroots level. So there will be uh, parallel initiatives, both at the government level and at civil society level. Yes, and of course, we heard from Ms. O'Connell how important it is that these events actually are bottom-up. But I do wonder how is the civil society sector um, going to uh, to be able to to put on these kind of, uh, of meetings to organize them um, without uh, without resources, for example. Well, you know, there's been a, an opportunity has resulted from this pandemic. Uh, Greece has leapfrogged uh, ahead in terms of digitalization. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been bold steps of progress over the last year in uh, the extent to which digital access and digital uh, communication has expanded um, and infrastructures have been built that were not there before, uh, initially in order to coordinate society, citizens in the face of the pandemic and the emergency measures of the lockdown. Uh, but these structures are actually there they can now serve uh, any purpose that is needed. Uh, and uh, over the last year, a vast majority of students and, uh, and school students and schools and universities and educational institutions are now equipped with the infrastructures and the, and the tools um, for digital communication and digital learning. And these will be the platforms or can serve as the platforms uh, through which civil society organizations can mobilize citizens and participate collectively um, at the communal level, at every level, in this pan-European exercise. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I would now uh, like to open the floor to our participants to, to ask questions. Uh, uh, we already have collected quite a few in written, but I do want to encourage uh, uh, everyone in the audience also to, um, um, to raise their hand and, and, and intervene uh, directly so that um, we don't have the impression that we are alone here. Um, and just to pick on some of the questions that have already been raised, um, we have, I, I want to put a name to the questions. So um, we have a question regarding the selection of civil society organizations that Mr. Clues mentioned will be involved in this 16 expert groups. How will these civil society representatives um, be chosen? Um, we have another question. Um, I'm sorry if I cannot find the name right now regarding the um, how do we ensure that these events are representative? How will the citizens be uh, selected? Um, and I will also ask one that is um, broader um, and linked also to the European level. What is known about the composition of the conference plenary? Will the plenary really wait for the European Citizens Panel to define the topics as stated in the joint declaration? These two questions uh, uh, come from Wolfgang Petzold. Um, and I see that um, Kinga wants to intervene, so I will um, allow you to, uh, to break the ice and, um, uh, and, 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 and comment or ask you a question. 
Um, I know that you've, um, uh, Blobsec has, has written a, a very interesting uh, study to which you have contributed as, as one of the authors. Um, and uh, it has looked, among other things, at regional differences and um, how easy or difficult it might be to organize this kind of, um, uh, of, of events, depending on whether you are from uh, Central Eastern Europe or Western Europe. Uh, Kinga, you have the floor, and then in the meantime, the, the panelists will reflect on, on the questions that I, I've, I've uh, um, quoted. Thank you very much, uh, Corina. Thank you for the introduction. I would also thank uh, EPC for organizing together this uh, timely event. And on behalf of GlobSec, uh, I would like to thank all uh, distinguished speakers for taking the time and contributing to this uh, hot discussion on actually how to make the Conference of Future of Europe uh, work. From what I uh, read from, uh, from your inputs is that even though it's not perfectly designed, it's not perfect, the conference is still uh, worth um, uh, pursuing and investing time and, uh, and uh, resources. Um, yes, indeed, in our papers, we were trying to look at the um, at uh, the um, Central and Eastern European countries, uh, their uh, experience with uh, deliberative democracy, different initiatives, and actually what that has already been done can be used uh, in implementation of the concrete initiatives, conferences, and uh, consultations. Um, I have a question maybe um, uh, when it, it relates somehow to the questions from the uh, audience about the random selections of citizens. What we've learned also by implementing projects uh, in the region, um, uh, we've learned that usually uh, those are one-way um, um, discussions, uh, panel discussions, uh, where the participants are not so uh, easy when they come, not, uh, uh, are not so uh, keen to ask questions or engage in the discussion. Uh, there are many reasons uh, for, for, for that, but what about the um, random selection of uh, citizens as well to particular activities? Uh, this is really timely, uh, this is time consuming as well exercise. Do you think um, uh, you're uh, on the national level, this is something that uh, could be uh, used uh, in order to ensure that uh, we uh, include in the discussion also people who do not usually get involved or do not know that much about uh, European uh, Union and uh, those um, European dimension of uh, their life is, uh, is not that close to the expert uh, level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kinga. Um, Mr. Klus, would you like to, to start since uh, we had a question uh, uh, targeting you specifically? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for this question. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we need to get out from our bubbles. This is the main aim of uh, set up uh, the conference uh, on the future of Europe in Slovakia. We understand that it's uh, useless and uh, maybe not that much important to, to persuade those who are already persuaded. Uh, so we need to get to the specific group of people. We are trying to find a way how to, how to reach them. Uh, so it will be fantastic to share uh, experiences also with the other panelists here. Uh, I like, for instance, the idea uh, from Ireland uh, to do, from Noel to, 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 to reach uh, people from very different uh, groups, uh, professional groups, for instance. Uh, so this could be one of the options. Another one is uh, I already mentioned, and that was a question uh, uh, at the question and answer section that uh, uh, how we can involve uh, uh, third sector uh, organization. And this is one of the ways we are thinking about uh, how to use their network to get to the regular people, to those who are not uh, interested in European affairs. Uh, so if we will have fruitful cooperation with the organization of, uh, for instance, disabled people, then we will reach also those who are not uh, regularly following politics. And uh, I believe this could be one of the way how to manage it. Uh, but of course, as I already mentioned in my uh, first uh, uh, speaking time, uh, we really want to involve also uh, self-governing uh, cities and regions uh, because they know whom to speak about, because uh, especially in the smaller villages uh, in Slovakia, there are some uh, 
very influential mayors who knows uh, about the contemporary situation in, in, in his uh, neighborhood or her neighborhood. And uh, we want to use uh, opportunity to, to somehow use these people uh, for, our, uh, for our plans. So this is also one of the way uh, we, want to, we want to manage. We can't hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Bomber, um, regarding the um, representative character of these events, how do you plan to make them uh, more representative? And also, uh, I will link this with another question that um, um, addresses Estonia. Uh, will you uh, plan to make use of the Baltic um, macro regional strategy to build um, um, opinion with East Estonia and its partners for the conference? A question from Stefan August Lutpianau. Yeah, maybe I will start with the latter one. Uh, uh, to, I, I think, uh, to involve other countries or organization is a good idea. We, we have it on our list. And, and we will definitely look at, at the options. What does it give? Um, and, but then, of course, as, as I mentioned, the, uh, the other side of this coin is that it has to be in English. So, so that the number of people who will uh, participate will be limited um, for those who are, can actually debate on EU issues in English. That, that's probably, if we speak of the wider rep representation of citizens, uh, I don't know how this all fits, but but we we are thinking of it. We will we want to see how how we can use this um, cross border regional dimension in it. But but so it it brings us back to this uh, representative question: how to make sure that we involve the people, and then how do we choose uh, who will represent the people in in, in the end of the day? So uh, I, I think probably the only reasonable answer that the people have to choose who will represent them, uh, how do we organize it, uh, uh, how it will be done, it's, we'll, we, we, have, we have no question for that yet, but, but in Estonia, I mean, we, we have even the national elections digitally, so, um, so, so that, that, that not for us, it probably won't be that difficult to organize uh, uh, electronic elections uh, uh, where people can put up candidates and vote for them. Uh, but I, I don't know. We, we haven't decided yet how to do that. But, but um, of course, uh, before we get there, we, first we have to involve the people to, to, to get them to come and, and to discuss and to listen. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we randomly choose people if, who are maybe not interested in the topic, uh, how that will work out. I guess uh, there has to be a, some kind of balanced way that, that everybody who is interested and who has something to say will find an easy way to participate and, and it will be made as, as uh, simple and, and um, not logical as possible. Of course, everyone who has something to say and is interested sometimes falls in the category of the usual suspects um, and the ones who are um, normally um, uh, not consulted about their opinion on the EU should be reached this time around. So um, we, we probably need to, to involve experts and those who have a long-standing experience in, um, uh, in ensuring uh, that, um, uh, that this kind of, uh, of, of, of audiences are representative or at least representative of different interests as I believe Ms. O'Connell uh, mentioned. Now, with respect to um, Ireland and, and, and Greece, um, I will extend this question to you um, um, as well. Do you plan to establish um, a transnational dimension in the national discourses um, uh, of, of this event? And also, um, another question that was raised by our participants um, the European institutions are planning to have this multilingual uh, platform um, to engage with European citizens. How, uh, how do different member states like Greece, like Ireland, and also the others, of course, um, represented on, on, on this panel, plan to use this uh, multilingual platform? 
platform, if at all. Um, who would like to start? Ms. O'Connell, would you be ready to, to, yep. to take the floor? Sure. Th thank you, uh, Karina. Um, yes, it, um, and very interesting um, topics raised by my fellow speakers. Uh, in terms of selecting the um, the citizens and the participants, we opted for a self-selection model, but through very aggressive and extensive engagement with, as I mentioned, with all the professional bodies, representative organizations, civil society groups to ensure um, that everyone couldn't say that they didn't hear about what we were doing. So it really was, um, a very comprehensive approach and really um, supported in a nonpartisan political sense that um, lended it um, political legitimacy um, at, at local, regional and national level. And then with government and ministerial engagement that really cemented it. And from the transnational um, uh, aspect of it, from an Irish perspective, um, we are increasingly seen, um, uh, we have a very uh, multi-ethnic society, um, multi-ethnic country, where, for example, in terms of uh, languages spoken in our country, Polish is the second most spoken language in Ireland. So that is due to the fantastic number of Polish people who have made Ireland their home. Um, so the greater number of um, you know the range of eu citizens that have lived in ireland who took part in our citizen dialogue future of europe process really added to that and i think the transnational pan-european element that george spoke about i do think that is really important to bring a european element to it because what we don't want is each member state and national country going down a silo national perspective we need to bring the findings and the outcomes and the discussion as well that needs to be fed back into a European platform to ensure um, to ensure either uh, greater reforms, greater engagement, and to reduce um, whether it's right or wrong, but to reduce this deficit and this lack of disconnect between uh, between the EU and its citizens. We we have a saying here. Um, that European Movement Ireland that we use quite a lot. We say that we tend to nationalize success and Europeanize failure. So we don't want the same thing to happen uh, for, for this conference on the future of Europe. And in terms of the languages platform, I I leave that to other colleagues to speak more on that because um, English is, uh, <laughs> English is well, English and Irish are, 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 are the, the two languages mo most here in, in Ireland, but it's easier, I suppose, for us um, um, on the English side of things. But we, are, we encouraged um, non-native English speakers to really input their views and their perspectives um, in our consultations. And we're going to continue very strongly with that because through that diversity and that breadth and, and we have a more representative and engaged response that we then can share and help shape the process. Thank you so much. Before uh, I bring in uh, George Pagulatos, I want to turn to Sandro Gotti and briefly ask him who is in charge of setting this uh, multilingual platform? We have a question from our participants about who is actually in charge of this. European Parliament and the European Commission together, the institution and the administration of the two institutions are already, have already been working for several uh, weeks uh, to, uh, to develop this platform, which I repeat, uh, must be multilingual. Uh, and it is a contribution to promote a more transnational debate. I also do believe that on one side, we have the duty to deepen the debate, uh, to root the debate at the local level, level. On the other side, for us, the debate, and also for the declaration of the three presidents, the debate must also, the presidents of Soli, von der Leyen, and, and Costa, uh, the debate must be also transnational. We hope, mm. uh, we think that this uh, multilingual platform run by the services of the Commission and the Parliament will be a contribution uh, to this uh, transnational dimension of the debate. Mm -hmm. Now we want to hear more about Greece. Well, um, I, I would expect that the transnational platform would have to be coordinated at the European Union level. Um, but having said that, 
I am quite convinced that there will be efforts uh, of the national, the Greek national debate to reach out to a transnational level and to European level. Uh, so it seems to me this have, has to work both ways, both bottom up, but also top down. Um, and of course, every level presents its own challenges. The, the challenge at the grass, at the national grassroots level is how to make people participate, how to mm. make them become interested and active. And the way mm. to, to reach out to people is what Noel said, go to the collective associations, to the civic society associations. But then of course you have many people who are not part of these. And then in, in many cases, they present important pluralities in societies at the age of uh, social media, Facebook uh, and individualization and echo chambers, there has to be a way to reach out to the people who are not organized under community organizations and associations because they, they probably are the ones that, that feel that they are left outside or behind. So one has to, to address this challenge. And then of course, at the pan-European or transnational level, the challenge is how to reach a sort of consensus on particular issue categories. And there it will be important to, uh, to point out specific strategic priorities and specific issues where you want pan-European debates to take place. And then when you move to the, to the European level, of course, the challenge is how you translate all this feedback into specific policy recommendations and policy reforms. Each one of these levels has its own challenges uh, and I think requires a commitment on the part of uh, actors, both institutional actors and civil society actors uh, to be able to address um, these challenges. Thank you so much. Sandra Gotti, I come back to um, the two questions that, that I posed to you earlier from one of our participants. What is known about the composition of the conference plenary and will the plenary really wait for the European Citizens Panel to define the topics as per the declaration? Uh, the, the answer to your se the second part of your question is yes. Uh, definitely. I mean, uh, the, the conference will want and must, uh, in our view, uh, of course, wait uh, for the outcome of the agora, for the consultation, of the debate. I mean, that's all the whole point, huh? uh, to bring up uh, from the bottom level uh, the ideas, the proposal, and to try to discuss uh, uh, how to turn those ideas, those proposals into operational decisions. Uh, in terms of common policies, in terms of institutions, in terms of treaty revisions, whatever, whatever that uh, it will be necessary to ensure a follow-up and the credibility of the exercise will depend on that. And if there are some issues that uh, uh, we decide that, that cannot be done or shouldn't be done, uh, you have to motivate, you have to explain very carefully. Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you do and uh, why and what you don't do and why. Uh, and that is also, I would say, the lesson that we can learn from the experiences done at national level, similar experience at national level. That is fundamental. On the composition, on the composition I can tell you what we have uh, proposed as parliament. Uh, it, uh, we have proposed the parliament to have uh, a large delegation from the European Parliament. We had said at the beginning, uh, 135 uh, members, um, uh, of course, uh, 27 members from the council, all the members of the council, it goes without saying, at ministerial level, uh, to have, uh, uh, we had said between two and four, but in my view, there should be more, uh, representative from the national parliament, that was, uh, was said in the parliament in the first uh, resolution, uh, to have, uh, to have repre representative of the commission, three commissioners, to have, uh, uh, four members uh, from the Economic and Social Committee and from the Committee of the Regions. That was uh, the first proposals, but now this must be discussed by the Executive Board. Huh? This is the proposal of the European Parliament, and that was around, uh, in terms of institutional representation at all at level, national, uh, European, region, and uh, social forces, uh, was around 227 uh, members for the conference uh, that should, uh, uh, should uh, in our view, uh, meet at least uh, every six months. And that would be really the moment where we try uh, to draw conclusions uh, from the debate. Uh, but the, the protagonist of the exercise is the open debate. It is not 
the meeting of the conference. The meeting of the conference is indispensable. Otherwise, there's open debate. We never come, we never talk into concrete reforms and concrete decisions. Thank you. Um, one of our participants actually mentions that um, you uh, brought up the treaty change issue. And so we know that he, uh, the, the, um, Paul Butcher in his question is saying, we know that the biggest resistance to treaty change comes from the member states. Uh, and this is a question for all the panelists. In fact, can we expect that, resist, that resistance to fade if the citizens clearly demand measures that require more EU powers. How do each of the member states on the panel feel about that idea? And to that, I will add a final um, and possibly equally um, uh, controversial uh, question. Um, why do we need pan-European debates and platforms if national debates are so important? Who would like yeah. to? Yeah, please, please go ahead, Mr. Gossi, if you want to uh, to answer. The platform is important because, uh, as we have uh, said all, uh, and as it is written in the declaration, the debate must also be transnational and European. The, the debate do doesn't have only to be local, regional, and national. So, of course, we need the platform. We need a very effective platform, and I hope that the platform will receive millions of contributions. The, the, the answer uh, to this question, uh, which I found strange, but I mean very legitimate. Uh, uh, um, uh, the point on uh, uh, the, the issue of the treaty revision. I mean, I tell you what we think. I tell you what I think. Uh, this uh, must be a serious exercise, a credible exercise. Uh, we don't uh, uh, disturb. Uh, European citizens uh, to tell us uh, what they think about uh, and what about Europe and what they want about Europe, and then we say, "I'm oh, sorry, you know what you ask about Europe needs to to revise the treaty, and we can't." Who said we can't? Who said we can't? Not even in Berlin, they continue to say that the Treaty of Lisbon would be the last treaty before 50 years. There was a lady in Berlin, and when the Treaty of Lisbon was ratified, said this, she also changed her mind, because before the Bundestag, she said, well, after the COVID, in the light of the conference, it might be necessary to revise the treaty. So it is clear for us that if the citizens require issues, I mean, make a request that involve treaty revision, we must revise the treaty. I tell you more, that you can launch a treaty revision by majority in the council. And I tell you another thing, that the European Parliament can trigger the re revision process. So I think that as European Parliament, we should take a commitment with the citizens and we are representative of the citizens to say, if, if what you ask require treaty revision, the European Parliament is ready to launch the process. And then there will be an open discussion. We cannot oblige anyone uh, to, uh, uh, to accept, but we cannot be blocked by anyone else. If you want to be taken seriously by the citizens to whom we ask what they want from Europe and undoubtedly also from us. Thank you so much. Any other takers on these two questions? If I may just add a word sure. here, because uh, when it comes, why do we need pan-European debates? Because it's a, we want pan-European solutions, so we have to have pan-European platforms. Uh, treaty reform, that's where the final deciders are the governments. What does it take? I think it takes uh, imagination and skill on the part of institutions in order to devise attractive, positive sum package deals of reforms, of institutional reforms, that can generate the kind of uh, super majority required or even let alone unanimity required to implement. That's not easy, that's not easy at all, but it's worth trying uh, because uh, treaties become uh, defunct after a certain point if developments in societies and economies are rapid. And we have seen rapid developments over the last decades in many different areas that have left the European Union poorly equipped to confront them. Thank you so much. Um, before we, um, we conclude the meeting, I want to allow um, uh, the, the one participant who's been brave enough to raise her hand to intervene. Lola, would you like to take the floor now, please? 
Sure, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Thank you for giving me the word and thank you for all your inputs. My name is Lola and I'm a junior researcher at the European Policy Center, TEP from Belgrade. I've thoroughly enjoyed your discussion today and I would like to offer some comments and ideas as well, if I may. While I do agree that there are many questions that need to be addressed regarding the enrollment of citizens in the Conference of the Future of Europe, an idea could be that some of the answers could be found here in the Balkans. I'll quickly reference the paper you wrote, Corina, with our program director, Milana Lazarevic. Um, the EU has nothing to lose and everything to win by deepening and refining its such consultative inclusion appears to unlikely to occur. Some good practices could be adopted from the Balkans in order to demonstrate that we are in fact still one of the priorities of the EU and its prospective future. So as a part of the Make Future Together EU and the Western Balkans from the Youth Perspective Project, alongside the Think for Europe network of think tanks, we have demonstrated how the region can come together and make constructive input in resolving issues. Our network of think tanks has been a pioneer example of effective regional cooperation among the region's civil society organizations. We have focused on the youth because we recognize that there is a window of opportunity to have the issue of not only enlargement, but also topics such as the environment, internet freedoms, and democracy, rule of law, um, all the topics that are actually quite relevant to the Conference of the Future of Europe um, discussed. We pushed and encouraged the youth to take active part in consultations. So, as I said, we engaged in structured, yeah, structured citizens consultations. Um, what this means is that we invited the youth from all around the country. And as other panelists have mentioned, we had a representative sample of all ages, uh, ethnicities, genders, regions to discuss the issue of internet freedoms, its positive negatives, and who should be responsible for regulating the internet space. Um, all partners on the project engaged in the same exact process, meaning that we all follow the same methodology or script, if you will. This kind of contradicts what both the Mr. Klus and Mr. Gotti have said, and that they're aware that every country is going to have its own approach. We chose to follow the same approach in order to allow for cross-regional comparisons of findings and to see whether we can adopt a regional approach in resolving the identified issues, which could be easily applied to the EU. We are currently working on producing a regional policy document, which will be presented to all relevant stakeholders and decision makers. Also, we will present this policy document to all stakeholders in Brussels in May. Therefore, I would strongly believe that the EU can look for some of the answers for the Conference of the Future of Europe that we and you guys have discussed today here in the region, as there are good practices all around and something can be learned from our very active civil society. So I would want to encourage the relevant EU officials to consider including the Balkan region in the conference as our project and our initiative demonstrate that we can cope with such a task, but more importantly, that it shows that we have something to say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Lola. I come back to our panel for uh, a uh, less than a minute uh, final statement. Um, Sandro Gotti, the Balkan countries have not been mentioned in the joint declaration. Um, why? Why? <laughs> Tell us why. Uh, the, the, the future of the Balkans lies in Europe, and we have repeatedly said so, and the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament has recently said that they also should be I mean, uh, included uh, somehow in, in form that we have to decide in the, in the work of the Conference of the, of the, on the Future of Europe. Um, so, I mean, I, I really, uh, I, I, but we have also to be honest, uh, there are things that we have to make more effective on the enlargement process. That was uh, there was a huge discussion, a huge discussion, an interesting discussion last year. We came up uh, with some proposal to uh, rethink the enlargement process effectiveness. The Commission came up with the communication, and we have uh, to uh, go along that line. And this is in the interest of both because we have to make that process uh, more credible. Also because uh, uh, the, the experience of the last big enlargement is extremely positive with some negative points that will be discussed with the PC at another time. And so we have to make sure that this time will be fully positive without some, a couple of pretty negative points for example, of rule of law. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ms. O'Connell, final remarks from your side? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have to be um, ambitious whilst uh, managing expectations as well, a little bit realistic. 
um, and also be open to change with nothing not being on the table. And, and as Paul asked in terms of treaty change, I come from a country that has had nine EU referenda in relation to treaty change. Um, I don't think that should be our starting off point, but we can't preclude it. And if that is the process and the outcome, then I think we have to we have to look at that and it has to be relatable and deliver something uh, for the citizens and getting the balance right between that top down and the bottom up and the national and the pan-European, it's, it's, it's going to be complex. And I really don't want to see it become too unwieldy. And I don't want it to become an institutional catfight between the different bodies and institutions, um, because I think there are too many priorities. We have to achieve something very tangible and time is pressing and short. Time is pressing and uh, there's a lot of coordination uh, that needs to, to be ensured. George Pagolatos, how do you feel about this? Uh, final words, are you more optimistic or less? less well, so? I, I, I'm optimistic that there is will to have this process deliver. I think there are converging interests on all sides to, to have actual results on the ground from it. So the, the incentives are aligned. Uh, it's it's hugely challenging, especially in terms of, of getting people mobilized and, and participating and translating this input into concrete proposals and action plans. But I'm optimistic in, uh, in that this is one more um, point uh, uh, that could, could represent a milestone in uh, the European integration process. We have seen it in reacting to crisis in a much more bold way than it does when things flow uh, in conditions of normality. And, and the fact that the European Union is in crisis mode practically over the last decade helps get this mobilization on the ground and um, take uh, the complacency, the forces of complacency out of the, uh, out of the way. Uh, as a final word, I fully agree with Lola. There must be ways to involve uh, the Western uh, Balkans, the candidate members, in that process and, and trigger a kind of cross-fertilization and a mutual European socialization uh, with these countries that have shown a commitment to become members of the European family. Thank you so much. Mart Volma, uh, in a way to a conclusion, what can you tell us? Um, well, I, 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 first of all, I always envy the native speakers and, and you know, what, what uh, Noel said about uh, the <clears throat> treaty change is exactly what I would, would like to say if I could, could actually manage the English that well, but, um, but exactly. So it's, it's, um, it can't be excluded, but, but uh, Estonians are kind of common sense and very rational people. And, and we remember how uh, how how resource uh, extensive was it last time to have this it is a huge convention i mean millions of euros spent uh, a lot of uh, oil burned to go there and and then we we get the negative referendum at the end of the day so i mean let's see uh, uh, if we have to go there we'll go there but but if we can avoid it it's it's actually much better and and uh, and one probably last thing that uh, at the bring me back to what said uh, that, that it, we will uh, uh, start a huge process with a lot of people. There will be a lot of expectations and we have to make sure that, that they will be taken forward. The, the, this European debate will, will get somewhere so that, that we don't end up as disappointment in the result of this huge process. So, so it, it will be a challenge uh, and for, for all of us and for the executive, executive board and for many. But, so we'll, we'll keep working and we want to make it success. Thank you so much. Uh, Martin Klus, um, last but not least, uh, this is a complex uh, exercise, uh, could be very expensive and uh, uh, certainly there are risks attached to it. Um, where do you stand uh, at the end uh, on, on, on this topic and uh, as we look to, uh, to kick off the exercise in practice? Well, I'm... Uh... A realistic optimist, uh, to be honest. Uh, realistic because, uh, as Mar said, there are a lot of uh, expectations, uh, but we are already running out of time. So I'm not that much sure if uh, actually nine months uh, will be enough uh, for such a discussion. And we need to be prepared uh, to stop it in one moment. 
to come with a conclusion uh, uh, to the European level, and then maybe come back again to the citizens uh, to discuss what we reach at the European level. So I believe uh, this is just the first level of the discussion. After a couple of years, we already had such a discussion and during the European Convention in the beginning of millennium, as far as I remember. Uh, so let's hope uh, this will be just the first step and the next step will continue and then we can easily start to discuss even the uh, treaty revision or something like that. But uh, now for nine months, uh, this is just a kickoff of the discussion. I'm very grateful that uh, also your institutions are eager to discuss it and uh, I'm very thankful that uh, you invite us uh, for such an interesting discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I am very grateful to you all for your frank and interesting contributions. This is a first level discussion. We will continue to work on this topic and go deeper and deeper, uh, and we'll make sure to uh, come back again and, and, and assess uh, uh, the, the implementation of, uh, of this initiative as it unfolds in practice. Thank you very much indeed also to our participants, and I wish everyone a uh, wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.